Hi everyone, so conscious we've got a lot to get through today, so let's just get started. Just to say welcome and thanks for joining our Law Lab session today. It's lovely to see so many of you joining us on this cold but summery day, um, all virtually, wherever we are. Um, just some housekeeping before we start. So the session's being recorded. So a recording will be sent out along with the bulletin that we usually send out after the session. So you can watch back to if there's anything that you missed or you want to catch up on. Um, if you do have any queries about that, then please check our privacy policy on the Bruness Paul website. Um, as usual, we'll just ask that people keep themselves muted unless they're asking a question and it just prevents any background noise. And as ever, feel free to ask any questions that you have. You can ask them via the chat function. Um, or you can wait till the end and we can have, if we have time, we'll do a question and answer session. Alternatively, if you want to catch up with any of the three of us, Hazel, Louise or I, after the session, then please feel free to do so or your usual Bernice Paul contact. So just to kick off this session, what we're going to cover today is I've got the fun job of the case updates. I'm sure you're all can't wait to hear those. And then we'll have the lovely Hazel and Louise from our public law and regula regulatory team. And they'll be talking about cyber attacks, which is obviously we're all aware is a hot topic at the minute. Um, and if you're like me, you're constantly getting emails from people who say that my data has been breached. So a really important topic to hear about. First case that we're going to look at today is Corby versus ACAS. And I always think this is an interesting one because we all know that ACAS themselves are involved if you are dealing with a tribunal claim. So it's interesting to see a tribunal claim against them themselves. So this case looked at whether an employee's opposition to critical race theory was a protected belief under the Equality Act 2010. In this case, the claimant was a conciliator at ACAS, which I'm sure many of us are aware of conciliators and what their role is. He made comments on an internal workplace communication tool concerning his beliefs on how to address racism. Following complaints from colleagues that the post promoted racist ideas, he was asked by ACAS to remove the posts, despite his employer dismissing the complaints that had been made. He raised an employment tribunal claim for discrimination on the grounds of religion and belief. And he also claimed to have protected philosophical beliefs under the Equality Act 2010 in respect of both race and sex slash feminism. In relation to race, the claimant stated his philosophical belief was an opposition to critical theory in general and his belief in the importance of character over race. His position was that the critical theory approach to racism is misconceived in that its belief in structural racism is diverse, diverse, divisive because it tends to see white people as a problem which can result in separatism, segregation and ethnocentrism. His preferred approach was that of Martin Luther, Mar Martin Luther King who desires a society where people are judged by the content of their character rather than the colour of their skin. In respect of sex and feminism, the claimant's stated belief was that it is unhelpful to view social problems through feminist eyes such as the initial view of at least one feminist that high male suicide rates are unimportant. Before the claims could proceed, the Employment Tribunal had to determine whether the claimant had a qualifying belief capable of protection under the Equality Act 2010. And as many of us all know, then the Employment Tribunal considered the five Granger PLC versus Nicholson criteria. Those for a quick summary are one, the belief must be genuinely held. Two, it must be a belief and not an opinion or viewpoint based on the present state of information available. Three, it must be a belief as to a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. Four, it must attain a certain level of cognancy, seriousness, cohesion and importance. And five, it must be worthy of respect in a democratic society, not be incompatible with human dignity and not conflict with the fundamental rights of others. So what happened at the Employment Tribunal? The claimant was questioned extensively about his beliefs concerning race and the Employment Tribunal found that he was able to explain them with clarity. The claimant had read widely on race and discrimination and it was clearly an important part of his life, in particular because he was married to a black woman and the father of black children. Throughout his life, the claimant had both worked and formed close relationships with black people. 
So applying the Granger test, it was un unanimously held by the Employment Tribunal that the claimant's views on race amounted to a philosophical belief for the purposes of the Equality Act. In respect of the second Granger principle, the second one being it must be a belief and not an opinion or viewpoint based on the present state of information available, it did not matter that the claimant had referred to his views in his witness statement rather than beliefs as this was sim somatics. The Employment Tribunal found that the claimant's beliefs were based on the teaching of a number of individuals and were grounded in a philosophical system, and his comments and posts all stemmed from that system. In contrast, however, the claimant's position concerning sex, feminism, did not pass the second Granger test. The claimant was found to hold an opinion only, relating to comments from one person, and the claimant was not able to articulate his views on sex and feminism more generally in the same way that he had done with race. The Employment Tribunal found these were opinions and not based on an underlying belief system. This is only a first instance decision and therefore it won't be binding on other tribunals. However, what it does show us is that the Employment Tribunal is considering more and more cases concerning what qualifies a, as a protected belief and employers need to be alert to this. If an employer receives a complaint, careful consideration must be given to whether the individual's beliefs are protected by the Equality Act. Employers should provide training for all staff concerning what amounts to a protected belief and encourage staff to respect their colleagues' beliefs, even if they do not share these or they disagree with them. An appropriate policy should also be in place. And if anyone would like to discuss anything about putting in place a policy or any training, then please do just let us know. The next case relates to Steele versus Spencer Road LLP. So this case was a high court case and it considered whether a bonus clawback provision on termination of employment was an unreasonable restraint on trade. By way of background, Mr Steele, the, the claimant, received both a salary and an annual discretionary bonus. So in January 2022, he received a bonus of quite a substantial figure of £187,500, £187, shortly after receiving this he then resigned. His contract of employment provided that if he left employment or gave or received notice within three months of the bonus being paid, he should repay the bonus. The contract also stated that the sum was recoverable as a debt from him. Given the figure, the bonus was considerably more than what Mr Steele's annual salary was. And Mr Steele ultimately refused to pay back the bonus upon the request by his employer. His employer there after served a statutory demand for repayment. And Mr. Steele applied to the courts to have the demand set aside. His position was that the clause was unenforceable as it was a restraint of trade and or a penalty clause. The court dismissed the application, holding that the clawback clause was not a restraint on trade and nor was it a penalty clause. Mr. Steele then appealed to the High Court, maintaining that the clause was a restraint on trade. The court held that whilst Cloy was clearly the clawback provision disincentivized Mr. Steele from leaving his employment, it was not ultimately a restraint on trade. Whilst the effect of the employment contract was that Mr. Steele would have to work for the employer for six months after payment of the bonus to retain it, as the bonus was repayable if he resigned within three months of payment and then ultimately had a 12 week notice period to work on top of that, it did not restrict who he could work for after he resigned. He was free to take up employment with a competitor if he wanted to do so. In addition, the fact that he was also subject to separate restrictive covenants had no bearing on the interpretation of the bonus clawback clause. Those were dealt with separately. Whilst this case did not concern a novel point, it's a helpful reminder that clawback provisions can be a helpful tool to either disincentivize employees from leaving soon after payment is made to them or to recoup certain payments upon termination of employment. Clawback provisions could also be used for repayment of enhanced family leave pay, which many people do if they pay enhanced family leave pay, if the employee does not return to work for a specific period following their leave. However, the clawback provision needs to be clear, needs to be carefully drafted in order to have the desired effect that you want it to have. So third and finally, we have Dobson versus North Cumbria Integrated Care NHS Foundation Trust. So in this case, the Employment Tribunal determined whether the dismissal of a female nurse for refusing to work more flexibly due to childcare was indirect sex discrimination. 
In this case, the claimant worked two fixed days per week as part of the respondent's flexible working policy. Due to the change in the respondent's needs, it reviewed all of the flexible working arrangements it had in place, and the claimant was asked to work occasionally at the weekend with notice, no more than once per month. The claimant refused on the basis that she could not get childcare for the weekends. Two out of three of her children were disabled, so had additional support needs. The respondent sought to engage with the claimant, explaining the business reasons for those changes, and the claimant refused to work more flexibly and refused to be placed on the redeployment register. Ultimately, Ms Dobson was dismissed and offered re-engagement on the new terms, which required her to work 15 hours a week on her usual fixed days, subject to the respondent giving advance notice of any different days to be worked. Ms Dobson then raised an employment tribunal claim for indirect sex discrimination and unfair dismissal. Just by way of background for those of you who may not be aware, indirect discrimination occurs when a provision criterion or practice, otherwise known as a PCP, applies equally to everyone but puts or would put people who share a protected characteristic at disadvantage when compared to others who do not share the same protected characteristic, so in this case sex. No discrimination will occur if the PCP was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim of the employer. The Employment Tribunal dismissed the complaint on the basis that there was no evidence that the PCP, here the requirement to work flexibly, put women at a particular disadvantage. The claimant appealed to the Employment Appeals Tribunal. The Employment Appeals Tribunal held that when considering disadvantage, the Employment Tribunal failed to take note of the childcare disparity, being the fact that women bear the greater burden of childcare responsibilities compared to men, and this can limit their ability to work certain patterns. It's well established from case law that judicial notice of this point should be taken without the need for evidence when considering the question of disadvantage. The Employment Appeals Tribunal held that the claimant had suffered disadvantage and remitted the case back to the Employment Tribunal to consider whether the requirement to work flexibly was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. The Employment Tribunal then looked at the case again and determined that legitimate aim was the need to provide care to patients in the community 24 hours per day, seven days a week, to balance workload amongst the team and reduce the cost of having to use band six and seven registered nurses on a weekend. Use of band six and seven nurses at the weekend meant that sometimes those senior nurses were not available during the week to work when complex decisions on patient care needed to be taken. The Employment Tribunal found that the aim was important and that the PCP was therefore rationally connected to the legitimate aim. The Employment Tribunal had to balance the extent of the disadvantage to the claimant against the interests of the respondent. It held that the respondent had made accommodations for the claimant's situation and was not asking her to work as flexibly as other colleagues, reducing the weekend commitment to a few times a year with advance notice for her. The claimant was unwilling to move at all. She did not feel that it was fair for her husband to be the weekend carer on his own after a full week of work. The Employment Tribunal considered that the impact on the claimant was at the lower end of the scale, as some family care was found to be available and therefore the PCP was justified. The claims for indirect discrimination and unfair dismissal were therefore dismissed. Whilst, changes are, whilst times are changing as more meals do take on childcare responsibilities, this case is a helpful reminder that the Employment Appeals Tribunal considers that the childcare disparity is still a point of which judicial notice should be taken. When determining a flexible working request or attempting to change a working arrangement, employers should therefore identify a legitimate aim, consider the childcare disparity and give due consideration to any disadvantage that the employee suffers. It's clear from this case that the Employment Tribunal was impressed at the extent of consultation and attempts made to reach agreement with the claimant, considering her individual circumstances. Case illustrates that with the correct consideration and consultation, sometimes an employer can require an employee to work a different pattern, notwithstanding the discrimination risks. So that's just a quick summary of those three cases. Um, we'll also be aware that you might be interested to hear about the impending holiday pay and trippy considerations. So everyone will or should um, have received the invitation to our really helpful webinar on these changes. But if you did miss that, the link to the webinar will be shared in the bulletin that we send out after this session. And I should also mention that the Agnew case that we're all aware of, um, 
if you missed the session on that, there will our, our bulletin on that, sorry, it will also be linked in the bulletin that will be sent out following this session. That's just a quick run through on the cases that we have at the minute. So I'll now pass over to Hazel and Louise to talk about the more interesting session, section of this session, which is cyber attacks. Thank you, Laura. And uh, I was about to say good morning, but it's good afternoon to everybody um, online. I'm um, good to see you all. So I'm Hazel Moffat. I am the partner that leads our cyber and data breach practice. And Louise is one of our associate specialist lawyers. Um, and we're involved in a range of cyber and data breach incidents from just the emailing of wrong information to the wrong recipients um, on the kind of data breach side to obviously a fairly cataclysmic cyber attack where an entire organization's systems are, are taken down and all of the consequential impact of that. Um, what we're going to discuss today is obviously not the the broad issues that are involved in a, in a cyber attack, but, but really a focused um, look at the employment, the HR angle on both employee data, employees who may be affected by a cyber attack in terms of their own information being compromised. But also, I think something that has been underplayed in, in certain of the cases we've worked on, which is the human element to a cyber attack on your employees who are engaged in an organization. And that's looking at both kind of pre-incident and some of the things that would be useful for HR teams and HR professionals to think about from an employee perspective before and hopefully never in the instance of an attack, um, but also what occurs during an attack that may be relevant for employees and certainly what we would call post-incident. So what are the things that we see our clients kind of grappling with that are maybe not obvious, but with a bit more preparation and planning from a kind of HR perspective, um, things could have been perhaps better anticipated. So we're going to really focus on that concept of kind of pre-incident things to do to get your house in order, some of the things that you think about during an incident for your employees. And then I'm going to pick up in particular on um, some of the aspects that will arise post-incident. So I'm going to hand over to Louise McAuline, who's going to look at the pre-incident issues for us. Thanks, Hazel, and uh, nice to be speaking to you all this morning, although perhaps on a less uplifting topic about cyber attacks and what, what will happen, as Hazel said. Just to start off with, the reason we speak with a lot of clients about this when, you know, the there isn't an ongoing incident is really just because of the threat landscape. It's becoming more and more prevalent that businesses will suffer some form of cyber attack or data breach. A recent um, UK government publication found that 32% of businesses suffer some form of actual cyber attack, not just a data breach or sort of minor cyber issues, but a full on attack. The bigger the business, the bigger the risk, but that's not to say that small businesses won't also um, be at risk from that. What an attack looks like can be very different depending on um, the organisation, depending on um, what happens. As Hazel mentioned, it might be a phishing email, it might be somebody clicks on the wrong link and exposes the system or it might be a more deliberate entry in, into the systems. That also means that if there is an attack, how that impacts on the business, how that looks internally can also be really different. It can be service interruption. It could be absolute disruption where there's no access to system. It could be data exfiltration. It could just be loss of data, loss of access. And a lot depends on how well set up the business is in advance for how significant the impacts can be, at least to mitigate them to some degree. So what to do pre-incident, particularly from that HR employment perspective, one of the really big risks for any organisation in uh, the event of a cyber attack is the personal data that's held by the business. Um, there are other risks in terms of confidential information, trade secrets, whatever else it might be that your business needs. But what you will have access to, what you work with, what you need, a lot of it will be 
personal data and a lot of it will be quite sensitive personal data. So a really important thing that you can do as part builds into the practices, processes and procedure in your roles is looking at what you have, where it is and why you have it. We've seen other organisations that post an incident really struggle to grapple with what they had in the first instance and why they had it. Um, there can be huge amounts of data accumulated that isn't necessary anymore or um, has been at one point considered to be necessary, but that hasn't been reevaluated. We always encourage our clients to go back and look at their policies and really think about what they're saying and whether that is an accurate reflection of what you do in the business, what you need and what your role requires from you. Um, we've certainly seen some instances of historic data that is defensible to have, but not where they have it in the system. You may find that you, you have a certain amount of older data relating to former employees that you have to hold for various reasons, for risk mitigation, litigation, whatever it might be. But if you're not using that on a daily basis, is can that be segregated? Can that be held somewhere else? Is there additional protection that you could have applied? Um, could you limit the access to only certain members of your team? Probably not everybody is going to need um, to access that sort of older information. But that's all part of good data hygiene, really looking through what you might have um, and what you're using. Often, we see the extremes of a really good policy that just doesn't reflect what, what the business needs, what your team needs, or we see the other extreme where um, the policy just doesn't, um, there's, the policy doesn't match um, what the requirements are. The principal obligations are keep data secure. Primarily, that will rest uh, with your data protection teams, your IT teams, but it is something that everybody has a responsibility towards in the business. Password protecting, um, saving files in the right place, um, limiting access. And then on the other side is minimising data. Again, there'll be policies, there'll be procedures, but you can build that into your working patterns and really re-examine what's been done and why. Um, that ties into the second point about proactively managing retention. Um, this is, we would always say, this is an opportunity for the across business working for different teams to come together. Um, it's important that those in HR, those working with that kind of sensitive and important data, important to the individuals, important to the business, are working closely with the appropriate teams, the IT teams, the cyber, the data management teams, and possibly even higher than that at board level, um, where it's required if additional support is needed or funding for certain aspects. Work with them, know who's responsible for the policies. If there's an automatic deletion, are you being reminded of that? Do you know when that kicks in? Is there anything that needs to be done from your side to allow that policy to come in, in, into play? And finally, having a plan, knowing what the incident response will be. Most businesses have them. They're generally a bit of a moving target, depending on how the business is operating, where what the risk profile is. Um, and that's something you should have some insight into because it will cover things like what the backup is, what the workarounds are, who's going to come in and support, if there are external um, partners identified to support you, whether it be legal or whether it be more on the IT side, who that would be, particularly thinking from a uh, HR perspective. There will be things like payroll, if that were affected, um, to the extent that's something that sits within your teams, What's the plan around that if, if there were to be an attack or an issue with access to systems around about payday? That's going to be really, really critical um, for the people that you're, you're managing and that you're responsible for. There are other things on the smaller end, but if a, an attack were to go on for 
quite a while. Things like monitoring annual leave, sick leave, people going on maternity leave. Have you got a backup access to those policies? And how would you work around the systems that you, you currently use to track these if they became unavailable for whatever reason? Generally, we expect a plan, an incident response plan, to cover quite a lot. Um, a lot of that will be decided at board. A lot of that will be focused on business continuity. So it's thinking about it from the internal business continuity and what, what you might need to know if there were to be an attack that would affect your systems or your information. So then looking at what you do in the scenario where there has been attack, we just move on to the next slide. During or in the immediate aftermath of an attack, as Hazel mentioned, where we see quite a lot of difficulty is against a backdrop of disruption generally, there can be a significant impact on the people within the business. And broadly, we see that in these three categories that we've, we've set out here. If there has been data affected, data exfiltrated, loss of data, data on the dark web, um, you know, something like that, even on the more minor scale of um, an Excel being published containing sensitive information. That was, um, that's what happened with the PSNI case where there was, a, in response to a request for information, there was a, an Excel published that had a lot of sensitive information about addresses and, and, and things like that. That has a real impact, obviously, on the colleagues that are affected within the business. And that's part of the planning element as well. If that were to happen, what can you do? Do you know how you would be able to support those individuals and making sure that as part of a responsible employer, um, as part of responsible employment practices, you have an understanding and a plan for how you would be able to support colleagues that are in that position. That's going to be particularly challenging if there is data affected and we don't have the full picture or, for example, the, the systems are also off, offline for a period of time. So trying to identify internally and thinking about what do you have in place? A lot of organisations have access to um, different sort of helplines, support networks and are able to refer colleagues there. But that can be very difficult if you don't have access to your emails, you don't have access to those systems or you don't have the ability to make the payments that the business does to engage those services. And you might need to start conversations very early with those third parties to make sure you can still access support services for anyone that might be affected. One challenge that we also sometimes see where there have been there has been data affected for colleagues, but also external data, maybe of customers has been affected is making sure a really consistent approach has been adopted by the business to ensure that colleagues are receiving the same information as soon as possible that aligns with what's been received by customers. Um, what can be difficult for um, businesses is managing communications with customers about what's happened and maybe sometimes fall down on communicating that internally or there is an appropriate oversight from the right teams on what's being said to um, internal and external that can lead to a bit of a gap. So it's really important to have that, that in mind about that consistency point. The other thing to remember, of course, is anything you communicate to colleagues about the impact of an incident could be communicated externally. And that's, that's the flip side of that. In terms of the impact on customer facing colleagues, it's a little bit sometimes like maybe a product recall um, or a mass kind of incident with your product that create or the company that creates a lot of negative publicity. Often cost, uh, colleagues that are customer facing uh, telephone lines or negotiating with third party suppliers, dealing with um, big contracts, there can be a really significant impact on them because they're coming under a lot of pressure and being asked a lot of questions about how the business is responding, what exactly has happened, and that can put a lot of pressure on them. So that ties into that point about knowing how you would be able to support um, colleagues where there is 
more limited access to systems or a bit of uncertainty. We really see in that crisis management for customer facing colleagues that um, training can be really helpful, perhaps a direct line to external legal support if necessary, um, a managed inbox that can be shared, um, that all queries relating to this incident can be um, directed there so that there is a shared responsibility, collective sense of working on it, sharing of information, and also ensuring that a really consistent line is taken across all customers or third parties that might be engaging with questions. And then finally, what comes next? In the immediate aftermath of, a, of an incident, you're starting to look at what exactly has happened and why that has happened. And that will mean quite often quite difficult questions are being asked of IT, cyber, data, any, any part of the business could be affected. And there's questions being asked about what was done and why, who decided, who made those decisions. And that can put a lot of pressure on individuals. It can be quite difficult conversations. And there can be a really important role for HR there in being involved in those conversations and or managing how that those conversations take place. Um, a balance always to be struck between you know, bringing HR in might worry some more than the needs to be, but it's about um, ensuring that you're kept in the loop of those conversations so that you understand who's involved, what the, the difficulties might be, and so that you can provide the appropriate support. And of course, it may be that some additional steps need to be taken, whether it's extra training for particular individuals or something on the more serious end. And that's why it's so important that you and your colleagues have been involved at the outset. So it's something we always encourage our clients to think about in the immediate aftermath of an incident is how they deal with this human element and how they can they can support their colleagues through that and how you your teams can get involved. So I'll just hand over to Hazel now who will move on to the, the last stages. Thanks. Yeah. So if we forward on the slides to the, the next one, the post incident. So Louise has talked a little bit about, you know, essentially you're in crisis at, at this point. Um, and that's why it's so important, as she's emphasised, that there is an incident response plan that people all have access to and are trained in and are aware of to essentially turn to in this kind of moment of crisis. And, and this is a personal experience. I have been in an organisation, working in an organisation that suffered a cyber attack a number of years ago. And actually all of our systems went down um, and everybody scrambled around because all of our phone directories were online, our telephone systems were all online, all of the business disruption plans and business continuity plans were all online and we had access to nothing at all. So there's a real point, I think, for your organisations to think about and HR teams, I think, can play quite an important role here about thinking about how employees get access to core bits of information that they need, whether it's just a set of um, emergency phone numbers, it's access to a, a third party hosted platform that has the business continuity um, details on it. And actually what we're often encouraging people to do is actually just have phone numbers and WhatsApp groups set up that can be switched on as an ability to, to contact people, particularly in those hours after an attack. And as the slide says, I think what maybe organisations that haven't suffered an attack um, maybe don't appreciate is that in many cases where it's been quite a significant attack, it may be that access to any element of the system may take a very long time to get restored and actually may never be restored. And that is something that we see um, fairly often is that entire systems go down, there is no full backup. And actually essentially these systems have to be rebuilt. Quite often a lot of information can be recovered, but sometimes some files can never be recovered. And I think in that particular period um, where it's pretty frenetic, the focus of a business or an organization is obviously getting back online, getting it back up and running, getting services delivered. Actually, that period of time is also really important from a legal and a regulatory perspective, because in the unlucky event that 
there are regulators who get involved in an incident such as this, and that will you know, quite often be the case if there's a large amount of personal data, it will be the ICO. If any of you are um, financially service or regulated business, it could be the AFC and it could be both of those that they often come in and have a look at not just what you did pre-attack, but also what you did post-attack. And we've seen the ICO in particular asking for information about what decisions were taken in the immediate aftermath of the attack. And so having training of staff and having, you know, codes that they can look at, having a business plan they can look at that talks about simple things such as how you document key decisions and making sure that what you're doing, as Louise has already flagged, is consistent with the plans and the continuity plans that you've got is really important from a regulatory and a legal perspective. So um, access to systems is slow and of course you know, the world goes on and, and so there has to be some ability, I think, quite often through third party providers who will provide access to at least some systems that can often help the immediate aftermath of an attack. And that brings me kind of directly onto this, the second point, which is one of the, again, one of the less maybe understood risks that we see from a legal perspective is what I call the risk of a workaround. And again, in the aftermath of an attack, you're trying to get the organization back up and running. So what do you do? Quite often our clients will default to personal devices, personal emails, um, you know, accessing documents, sending things around through you know, Gmail, Hotmail accounts, WhatsApp. Um, government's quite bad for that, it would appear. But, but genuinely, that's a, a fairly serious risk. As again, from a legal and a regulatory perspective, the regulators will often look at what you have done in those days and weeks after the attack. Because one of the things that they want to assess is whether or not essentially you have a robust response and whether your systems and approaches are good enough to effect and, and resilient enough to cope with a cyber attack or a data breach. In other words, do you have backups? Do you have access to backups? Do you have business continuity plans that allow you to have um, legally compliant workarounds and by that I mean so that you're not sending large excel spreadsheets to that are unencrypted to personal devices and um, the individuals are not exposing um, the organization to more data breaches essentially by having to try and implement these workarounds all in good faith to get the organization back on its feet but the, the ICO and also claimant law firms who might be representing individual customers or employees who are affected by a data breach or a cyber attack, they can ask for that kind of information as well. So in your business continuity plans, in your training, think about from an HR perspective, what people might need to access, how you can provide some kind of continuity plan for them and have rules that are quite clear from individuals about what you do and you don't do in the, the kind of hours and days after the attack. Um, and then the learnings, I mean, there's probably a couple of other things I want to wrap up in this, but one of the obvious learnings, and, and Louise has touched on this, is I suppose the fact that as an employer, you are in a position of trust with your employees. And the business at this point in time will focus on its reputational risk to customers and suppliers and the media if it's a, a very large attack and it's already in the media. Please don't forget about um, the trust relationship that you have with your staff. Louise has touched upon the fact this could be a particularly difficult period of time for staff trying to get the business and the organisation operational again. Quite often we see staff working either paid or unpaid a lot longer hours to try and get things moving. The IT team in particular will be doing that as a matter of fact. Again, a learning point there is make sure from an HR perspective, your business continuity plan builds in the ability to get extra resource from an IT side because that will almost always be required in a major cyber attack. So think about, think about those things. And then the other point is you will quite often as an HR team probably have to at some point speak to the board or your legal teams or your cyber risk teams about notification of employees who are impacted. And Louise has touched on the kind of consistency of message between the outside world and your employees. Um, but we've seen plenty of clients who have done you know, a sterling job in you know, handling the media, 
um, putting website notifications out, notifying customers and suppliers that their data is or may be affected and forgetting to do the same for their staff. Now, the chances are the staff all know there's been some kind of cyber attack if it's a significant one, because why? The working systems will have to have changed. Please make sure that the top of your list is coming out with a clear and consistent message to your staff and a regular one to update them on two things. One, first of all, whether their data is affected and what more updates and support there will be in relation to that. And then the other side is, you know, what support is there to, to get their, you know, make their jobs easier and um, get them back online, get them back working. So those two elements are really important. And clients that we've seen do this well have had things like daily briefings set up, kind of town hall meetings in person if there's no online option, um, setting up systems and calls with regular check-ins with probably, you know, team leaders who are prepared and trained to take that role to make sure that people get the chance to voice concerns and ask questions. Back to my point about workarounds, if people are sharing experiences and ideas, you can quite often surface up potential risks to the business of people going off and doing things differently. So, you know, have these town halls, have these online check-ins if the system can, can provide it. Um, sometimes it can be daily, certainly it should be weekly, and document what the staff are asking and make sure that you're trying as a business and organisation to answer those in a, in a consistent way. Keeping your staff engaged and feeling trusted and informed is really important for clients that we see in getting through this um, as quickly and as easily as possible. Losing staff trust will probably, one, mean you lose staff, first of all. Um, there was an, a, a computer weekly survey last month that talks about the fact that over 50% of staff said that they would consider leaving their employer if they badly handled um, a cyber attack. So that's a significant potential um, risk to you. Um, if you don't handle things properly, but getting them in briefed, informed, and feeling like they're important and they're and they're and they're being trusted is really important. Um, a couple of other things that we've learned from um, experience, I think, it's really worth thinking about, is where you have employees' data that is affected. Um, what do you do in that case? Um, you know, there's plenty of legal advice out there, but you do when individuals may have claims that may be affected or may not be affected. Um, but with employees, again, back to that trust piece, um, some clients of ours have, even if um, employee data isn't affected or even if only a minor amount is affected or they're not sure if it's affected, they go on the kind of proactive footing and they say to their staff, we care about you, we care about your data, whether or not it's affected, we're going to give you, for example, um, free credit monitoring that um, we can provide um, for a year or two that can give you peace of mind. Um, some clients have, particularly where they think that maybe payroll data might be affected or financial data is affected, have said we will provide a facility of um, loans, staff loans, um, at, at no interest or a small amount of interest. If you think your credit might be affected and that might be particularly difficult for you, um, we'll help give you access to funds for a period of time with obviously usual conditions attached to those. Quite often clients will offer to pay for, you know, new passports, new driving licenses, um, new bank cards, if those ID documents have been affected. Um, and another piece is if it's a significant attack, the police will probably be involved and quite often um, employees can want to deal with the police as well if they think their bank account details may have been compromised. And a good employer can wrap their arms around that and help to have those conversations and set them up with the police coming into an organisation um, and helping staff um, address things like that rather than leaving them to deal with it on their own. Um, so the concept of support, and again, some, some clients will even offer their staff some compensation. Um, it could be added benefits of some description. It could be financial compensation. And um, usually that's on the extreme case where they know that data has definitely been impacted. But thinking through all those points, from an employment perspective, well in advance of a cyber attack, can only benefit your organisation and try and take out um, what can essentially go wrong in, in the aftermath of an attack when quite often nobody's thinking straight, nobody has access to the right information um, and everybody's mind is elsewhere. But yeah, we see a lot of clients who 
focuses all their attention on rebuilding the IT systems and maybe dealing with third parties. And they really forget about the need to provide support to their employees, um, clarity on what's happened to their data, and a real understanding of how to navigate and take your employees with you through what is quite a difficult journey. Um, so that's a really important thing that we have, as I say, um, regularly seen go wrong. Um, and sometimes regulators can come in and ask to interview staff to understand their perspective on a cyber incident. And you want your staff to be as supportive and as informed um, and as helpful as possible at that point. I'm going to stop there um, and say that's the kind of... I guess the, the speed read from us in terms of kind of do's and don'ts and preparing your organisation for an attack from a kind of HR perspective. I'm very happy to open up to any questions or comments that people might have, um, either for myself or Louise or, or Laura as well. Thanks, Louise and Hazel. That was really, really helpful and really interesting. We have just one question in the chat box at the minute and that's from Vivian who said can an employee be dismissed following a cyber attack so from an employment perspective it will depend <laughs> I feel I say this every time I'm on one of these sessions it depends on the circumstances is it a mistake is it malicious has it been maliciously done and um, will be considered as to whether an employee would be dismissed Hazel Louise I don't know if you have anything from your side if you've seen this before yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, I suppose, so So let, let's take a step back and go, we're not dealing with a data breach, which is um, an employee accessing information it should, it, or he or she shouldn't have, or um, sending out a spreadsheet really negligently or anything like that. If, we do, if you're talking about a cyber attack, the chances are probably not because it's an external event. Essentially, you're a victim of crime, as is often the case. Um, however, that said, ultimately, um, if it's a really significant attack, either the regulator might want some, you know, might want some kind of accountability, claimant firms might go to court and there might be questions about an organisation's um, decision making. Um, where and, and you can get shareholders, and this is very true of, of US companies who put a lot of pressure and responsibility on certain individuals at board level who are, of course, employees, so like Chief Information Security Officer, Director of IT. And there are occasions, and particularly bad cyber attacks, where usually an employee isn't, isn't um, dismissed, but they quite often end up having to resign, usually having been nudged into, because they have simply failed in delivering um, their 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 responsibilities for the area of the business properly. That's pretty unusual, I would say, in the UK. But there's definitely instances of that in the US, and it but it tends to be at that very senior employee level, so director of IT, director of risk, etc. It is it is still certainly in the minority. Um, it's more common to see employees being dismissed in a more um, in, in not in a cyber attack situation, but in a kind of data breach where usually they've illegally accessed information that they shouldn't have had, had access to and, and essentially taken out of the organisation. So in that cyber attacks, it's unusual, but it's not impossible. And it is a trend coming from the US. Thanks, Hazel. Vivian just confirmed, she said, I meant dismissal when the employee opened an email or used the system that led to a cyber attack. I've not seen anyone being dismissed for that. I have seen them being disciplined and I have seen um, more commonly um, being asked to undertake very specific training. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like a lot of it would come down to the training that's been given, how aware staff are of that. And um, if, as you say, he's all more likely be further trainings being given to them um, and disciplinary action, but may not lead to ultimately dismissal. We've got another question from Kelly, which is, if an employer has poor data hygiene, would this allow an employee to resign and claim constructive dismissal following an attack? Would a leak of personal data generally be grounds for a constructive dismissal claim? Hazel, I don't know if you want to cover in terms of anything you've seen before. I, uh, I've not seen that. Um, I haven't seen that. I have seen a situation where... Um, 
a member of the IT team who actually was being criticised in the aftermath of attack, this is quite a few years ago now, um, went off on ill health and stress grounds, probably quite understandably, and then brought some, then brought an employment tribunal claim um, based on um, a form of constructive dismissal and brought in a lot of the kind of points that you're making, which is there were systemic failures in the organisation. Um, I was put under undue stress. It's essentially constructive dismissal because um, I've seen papers that have talked about the fact that we didn't do X or we didn't do Y in the IT team. Um, and I think that was actually unfair. And it was due to, for example, lack of board leadership and or lack of funding rather than anything the ITT didn't it. So those issues are, I think, definitely starting to come into play more, um, but probably maybe not quite as is suggested, um, but it's definitely becoming more of an issue. And in particular for, I see that the frontline individuals often in the IT team who feel that they're potentially in the, on the hook for some kind of blame, um, quite often because of a regulatory investigation. Thanks, Hazel. And Vivian's just added, having poor dental hygiene is more whistleblowing, which could be grounds for resignation and constructive dismissal in case no. So I suppose it depends for whistleblowing if they've raised the concerns that they had about the data hygiene um, being poor in advance um, and normally they could go from there. Yeah, I mean, poor data hygiene is probably um, true of 100% of organisations we deal with. Um, it depends what you mean. I think there's a difference between some elements of data hygiene being poor, which is almost everybody, to to um, a kind of total disregard for data protection rules, um, which that that would be the kind of thing that would trigger more of a whistleblowing, to be honest. I, I've not seen cases like that, but I've seen quite plenty of cases where, you know, internal colleagues are questioning why certain things are being held or accessed in a particular way. But I've not seen any legal cases on those things yet. They will come at some point, I would have thought. Brilliant. Thanks, Hazel. So I don't think we have any other questions unless anyone has anything else. No. OK, well, all that's left to say is thank you so much for joining today. Thanks to Hazel and Louise for giving us that really helpful insight. And as ever, if anyone has any questions that they want to follow up with, then please do feel free. And our bulletin will be circulated within the next couple of days, um, which has all the information about the cases I talked about earlier um, and our usual updates, legislative, et cetera. But again, thank you all for joining and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.